All right, we'll go right into our next panel, which is going to be our sector panel. I'm excited to introduce our next panelist here. Um, these guys run the fintech, healthcare, and real estate portfolios. Um, so I will ask them to do a quick brief introduction, then maybe a few minutes of comments from each just to tee it up, and then uh, we'll go from there into your questions. So uh, maybe I'll start, since Josh over here on my left, if you would mind introducing yourself. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Josh Saltman. I manage the Barron FinTech Fund. Uh, this is a sector fund that invests in the intersection of financial services and technology. Great. Neil? Hi, I'm Neil Kaufman. I manage the Barron Healthcare Fund. Hi, Jeff Kolich. I manage the Barron Real Estate and Real Estate Income Fund. All right, great. Thanks, guys. So, uh, again, just to warm us up a little bit, Neil, maybe take a few minutes and tell us what's interesting in healthcare these days. Sure. So, healthcare has had a very challenging year this year. Um, the underperformance of the sector relative to other sectors in the market has been pretty dramatic. I saw a statistic recently that the underperformance, uh, healthcare has been the worst, it's been the worst year in 30 years for the sector on a relative basis. Um, so what's going on? So I'll, I'll talk about two categories that are really um, hitting the sector, and that is starting with, we're in this period of post-COVID. We went through a, a period of substantial investment in the life sciences <clears throat> industry during COVID. There were billions of dollars invested into vaccines and productions of, of vaccines. Companies across the chain were investing or, or stocking up on inventory. And so now we've seen over the past year or two sort of an unwind of what happened, uh, an unwind of that bulking up of investment. So that has led to destocking of in inventory. It's led to, you know, interest rates which were at zero during COVID and went to, you know, very high level, 5%, um, led to funding constraints for small biotech companies. There's been a dramatic slowdown in China. Um, and then there's just been an overall um, cautiousness among pharma companies. So that's been, a, that's been one dynamic that's hit the healthcare sector. The other dynamic is the rise of GLP-1 medicines. So I'm sure you've all heard about Ozempic, Wagovi, Manjaro. These are a new class of, not a new class, these are new medicines in the GLP-1 class that are resulting in not just treatment of type 2 diabetes, but substantial levels of weight loss. Um, and so Wall Street has uh, come to the conclusion that this category of medicines will become broadly adopted among the population because of their success helping people lose weight. Um, we saw data over the summer from a trial run by Nova Nordisk that showed a 20% relative risk reduction in people um, with prior cardiovascular disease, uh, risk reduction in cardiovascular events, um, and that set off sort of a chain reaction among many different types of healthcare companies, including medical device companies, healthcare providers. There was an assumption that this category of medicines was going to be broadly adopted, and, and what are the ramifications of that? So perhaps uh, fewer people will progress to diabetes, or um, if, if more people are on these medicines, or fewer people will be taking insulin. They might be able to reduce their insulin use. So that had an impact on medical device companies in the diabetes device category. Um, weight is associated with sleep apnea, so the idea that um, you know, millions of people will be on these medicines could potentially impact sleep apnea device companies. Um, so there were very broad um, impacts across the entire sector. So despite the underperformance that we've seen this year for the sector, for people who have a long time horizon and who are patient investors, we're, we're starting to see some really interesting opportunities across the sector. So I'll, I'll turn it back to David. Thanks, Neil, for that, and uh, congrats on having hit the five-year anniversary earlier in the year as the first percentile versus your peer fund. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. You Josh, we're going to turn to you now, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so I'll talk about what's going on in financial services and uh, fintech. 
So financial services, more broadly, is, is one of the more macro-sensitive areas of the economy. It's also one of the largest uh, sectors in the economy. Uh, I'd say the, the big earthquake was in March with the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and the subsequent failures of Signature Bank and the takeover of First Republic. Uh, this, is, this is all driven by interest rates and deposit flight out of banks to higher yielding areas, whether they be money market funds or corporate bonds. So there, that's causing uh, a fair bit of distress in the banking sector and is causing banks to pull back on lending. Now, it, it's not all doom and gloom because that's creating opportunities for some of the companies that we're invested in, in the FinTech fund. Uh, such as non-bank lenders that are seeing more opportunities come to them because banks are pulling back, uh, as well as technology companies. So it's more difficult for banks to, uh, to grow earnings when deposits are leaving, their funding costs are going up, and they're slowing down on lending. So that creates more onus, uh, a greater impetus to invest in technology to improve efficiency. So banks are pulling back. And there is also concern or, uh, about uh, consumer spending. So far, we haven't really seen it. Consumer spending has been quite strong. Uh, so we invest in payment companies like Visa, MasterCard, and Fiserv uh, that are showing very strong um, payment volume growth. So globally, pay, you know, card payment volume is growing about 10% per year. Uh, it's mid to high single digits in the U.S. and double digits uh, internationally. Now, that's a function of resilient consumer spending. It's also uh, reflective of the secular shift from cash and check to electronic payments. So despite the challenges that we're seeing in, in, in certainly major areas of financial services, be they banks uh, and insurance companies, Baron Fintech Fund is finding great opportunities uh, for growth, and as a result, the, the fund is up double digits this year. Okay. Jeff, you're up. Great. Uh, great to be here today. I'm going to be brief with my uh, introductory comments. Last year, I, I spoke too, too long in my, uh, my intro comments, so I'll be very brief and we'll open up for questions. Uh, over the last, call it now, we're going on four years, real estate has certainly felt as if it's been in the eye of a storm, starting with COVID and its negative implications for office real estate and other categories. Uh, then multi-decade high inflation and the corresponding increase in interest rates, which Josh just touched on. Fed increasing interest rates, 525 basis points. Mortgage rates going from 3 to 8% credit spreads blowing out in part due to some of the bank failures that Josh touched on. And in that, it's felt as if real estate's been in this, you know, eye of a storm for a few years now. Um, not all categories, but, but some. And I suspect it's left some of you in the room today concerned, cautious, perhaps even bearish about the prospects or the outlook for real estate. Uh, our team's not in that camp. We're optimistic about the prospects for real estate. We think the setup looking out over the next two to three years is compelling. We're leaning into a number of areas of investment opportunity, from REITs to home builders, to travel-related real estate, to commercial real estate service firms, to real estate alternative asset managers, to property technology companies such as Andy Florence and CoStar, who's presenting right now and was on CNBC this morning. And we think we have two compelling real estate products to navigate the ever-changing real estate landscape. Uh, they're both flexible, they're comprehensive, and we actively manage them. And so with that, why don't I stop and Thanks. we'll open it up for questions. Perfect. And um, well, if you wouldn't <clears throat> mind, we have three mic runners that are going to go around and answer your Okay, so we're going to start over there. I just want to take one minute before we go to the question and just give kudos to Josh, who's now run this fund for over four years, FinTech, and is about 800 plus basis points ahead of his peers, which is pretty amazing in that time. So kudos to you, Josh. And also recognize Jeff for both of his funds, which, you know, ranked number one and number two, respectively, for real estate, real estate income since inception in their categories. And has won the Lipper Award for three-year performance, what, three times, I think? So um, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, and with that, Wayne, it looks like you have a question. This question is for Neil. 
Neil, you mentioned the GLP-1 drugs, which have been so good. Just the other day, Eli Lilly got approval for weight loss. And my question is, it's been a great stock so far. What kind of runway do you see ahead? For Lilly in particular? For, for Eli Lilly. Yeah, so, I mean, Lilly is a unique large cap pharmaceutical company with substantial growth ahead. The stock price has had significant outperformance over the past year or two, uh, based on high expectations for their diabetes and obesity portfolio. Um, we're still positive on Eli Lilly. We think perhaps the return profile for, for, for that stock is, you know, from, from these levels might not be what it was, you know, a year or two ago, but there's still a lot of opportunity for growth ahead. Um, they have, you know, their, project, their revenue is projected to grow from 34 billion roughly this year to 90 to 100 billion over the next you know, six to eight years. Um, and their earnings are gonna go up you know, well over four or five times in that time period. So this is a, a true uh, growth company um, in a sector where growth is difficult to find. It's a, so it's, a, it's really a unique company. They also have an Alzheimer's portfolio. Um, they've been very smart with their business development this year. They've made a number of um, small acquisitions of earlier stage companies. So there, there is a lot going on at Eli Lilly. It's not just the GLP-1 portfolio. So we, we remain positive on the stock. Scott has a question up there. And then we'll go. A question about healthcare. Um, the medical instrument side is conversely to the story you're talking about. Lilly has been hard hit. What do you think is going to change regards to valuations going forward? Is it products or is it the macro environment? So I, th I, th I think we're in this period where, you know, sentiment swung way too negative in the medical device area. Um, people, you know, started to extrapolate pretty severe um, impacts on, you know, a whole range of medical device categories based on, you know, widespread adoption of these new drugs. Um, I think in many cases, um, the, you know, the, the stock reaction was, you know, o overdone. And so there are, you know, there are a number of categories where you won't necessarily see an impact on procedures, uh, cardiovascular procedures, for example. You know, we had a situation where, you know, statins in the 90s became uh, very widely adopted and there wasn't an impact on cardiovascular procedures. Um, and so that's an example where, you know, device companies in that area seem to be, un, you know, unfairly impacted. And then there's the question about, what about hip and knee procedures? Well, you know, if, if people are taking these weight loss medicines um, and they, they lose substantial amounts of weight, will that impact the overall procedure volumes for hip and knee replacement procedures. Um, and, you know, obesity is just one factor in arth arthritis, which, which leads to these, to hip and knee implant procedures. Um, and we think, you know, time will tell, but we don't see a severe impact in that area either. Um, and then, you know, sleep apnea is a multifactorial condition Weight is a, you know, a big driver of sleep apnea, but it's not the only driver. And so, so one of our holdings, Inspire Medical, which sells a, a, an implantable device that treats sleep apnea, um, it, the analysis there about what the potential impact is going to be on their business is, is somewhat nuanced because they, there are a lot of severely obese patients who are not candidates today for their procedure and if they lose weight, they may become candidates. So there might be, you know, some patients who drop out of their, their funnel, and then there will be patients who come into their funnel. So, um, you know, we think that there could be sort of an even split between the two, perhaps, um, and we'll see. Um, thank you. Jennifer has a question there. Uh, Charlie Epstein, longtime investor and advisor recommending Barron Funds, and we really appreciate you. Question again for healthcare. Uh, we really have a sick care system, we don't have a healthcare system. And so my question is more on the contrarian approach to the longevity 
what's happening in the healthcare industry around longevity. My wife's here, she's gonna live to 156, I'm gonna live to 148. Which bodes the question, why does she live eight years longer than me? And she'll tell you she wants eight years without me around, but that's a different story. <laughs> so as a contrarian investor, uh, where, if anywhere, are you deploying research and assets? Because 60 is now, uh, 120 is the new 60. And uh, are you investing in any of the longevity enterprises that are out there? I can think of the Gladstone Institute in San Francisco, uh, other, other areas where longevity and having a healthcare system instead of a sick care system. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there isn't a specific company that uh, fits that theme. I, I think, in general, the aging of the population will, you know, be a secular driver for the industry. So we have an investment in HCA Healthcare, the le one of the leading hospital operators, which will benefit from the aging of the population. Um, we have investments in a number of medical device companies that, you know, will also benefit from the aging of the population. Um, just. It's just a, a secular theme in terms of, you know, the severity of disease um, and procedures increasing as the population ages. Um, but there isn't a, a, you know, we're not, I can't think of a, uh, I know, I remember we met with a company that was focused on longevity. It was very early stage in, in the pharmaceutical area. Uh, we didn't invest in it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, uh, you know, the, the amount of health care services that the population will need um, in the future will continue to rise. So health care spending does increase faster than GDP, um, and a big driver of that is the aging of the population, which will only continue to increase. Okay, we're going to go over by Wayne. Question? Hi, good morning. So we're seeing some spreads in the mortgage-backed security space widen and REITs seeing volatility. Can you discuss your outlook on commercial real estate and how it impacts the regional banks? I guess we could both take that. I'll, uh, you want to go first or do you want to Why don't you go? talk about commercial real estate yeah. and I'll talk about the implications to the banks. So, um, great question, first of all. Uh, and you get a two-part answer. So I'll, uh, I'll kick it off. Um, real estate is being painted with a broad brush stroke. Um, that's our opinion. We've been writing about this since the first bank failure, Silicon Valley Bank, back in March. And back then, we wrote about that it was our opinion of Barron Capital that the narrative around a commercial real estate crisis or the challenges that would be forthcoming are somewhat sensationalized, that the challenges in BNC office assets are largely isolated to that and won't uh, spiral across most of commercial real estate. From our perspective, and I bring this up rhetorically, you know, crisis is, is a, um, a word that is, is used and is scary. And we step back and ask rhetorically, well, what is a commercial real estate crisis? What would be the impetus for one? And when we peel it back, we say, well, number one, it would be demand. Is demand falling off a cliff for commercial real estate? Yes, there are challenges in B and C, lower quality commodity office. Um, assets, but if you look across most commercial real estate categories from shopping centers to apartments to warehouses to self storage facilities to hotels to healthcare, et cetera, one, demand's performing pretty well. That's number one. Number two, if you look historically over decades, the historical curse of real estate that has led to crises in the past is when one of two things occur. Number one, after a period of reasonable growth, a lot of leverage is taken on. That's not the case right now. Most of real estate is well capitalized with lower levels of debt, well staggered debt maturities, appropriate mix of fixed versus floating rate debt, et cetera. And once all that debt is taken on, what does the developer do or the acquirer with the debt? They go out and build a lot of real estate. Exactly at the wrong time is the economy's rolling over and you're left with a bunch of empty buildings, hotels, apartments, office buildings, shopping centers, warehouses, et cetera. Well, 
fast forward to today, the last three or four years, there's been very little new building of commercial real estate. Why? Because it's not economical. Land costs have gone up, labor costs have gone up, material costs have gone up, and access to capital has been a challenge. If you look at over the next three to four years, and somewhat in part to some of the challenges with the commercial real estate banks right now, there's very little new construction in the pipeline. So we're starting from a base today, wherever the economy may be going, where most of commercial real estate is 95% occupied or higher, with very little new construction in the pipeline over the next several years, and well-capitalized balance sheets. And so when we put this all together, we are not in the camp that commercial real estate is heading into a very challenging period. Yes, you will read about isolated cases of individual assets or certain markets that might be challenged, but again, this narrative that's been in the newspaper and various pundits on TV talking about, we think is sensationalized and unlikely to materialize. You know, Josh, if you want to add. Yeah. Uh, so I lean a lot on Jeff and his team for their views on the commercial real estate market and the follow-on effects that that will have on commercial banks. From my perspective, I don't think that there is a systemic problem across the US banking system. There may be uh, additional small and mid-sized banks that suffer, that go under, uh, but for the most part, from my perspective, banks are well capitalized. And the issues they're facing today are not a capital problem, but really an earnings problem, uh, where their funding costs are going up, uh, and so they're responding to that, uh, and the macro uncertainty, they're responding to that by pulling back on lending. Um, so this enables them to further build up capital levels, but it's not so great for the broader economy when banks are, are tightening lending standards. So from my perspective, it's an earnings problem, not a capital problem. Banks pulling back, uh, as I mentioned, creates opportunities for non-banks, uh, for companies like Apollo Global that we invested in earlier this year that is well known for being a, a distressed uh, private equity and distressed credit investor, uh, but they are also uh, increasingly um, uh, a lender in the private credit market for investment grade uh, loans. And so they see a tremendous opportunity to uh, make additional loans. Uh, their fundraising machine is, is much better. Uh, so they raise more durable uh, financing by selling annuities and managing capital on behalf of insurance companies and other institutions, that's much stickier capital. If you think about what, uh, what caused Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank to go under or, or to be taken over, it was because they were funding long duration assets with what were ultimately flighty deposits. Uh, the fact that you uh, can withdraw your deposits at any time on a daily basis, but they're funding multi-year loans on the asset side. Outside of the banking system, uh, companies like Apollo are raising uh, funds, multi-year funds. They're also selling annuities that are protected from lapses. And what that provides is far more certainty of funding and certainty of cost. That enables them to make these long duration, illiquid loans and earn an attractive spread with much lower funding risk. All right, thank you both. Scott has a question over here. Uh, this is a question for Jeff. Um, so I know I typically ask questions around things inside your portfolio, but maybe taking the opposite route, um, you know, given towers come down quite a bit, um, you know, is this space you're seeing attractive valuations and something you'd want in the portfolio going forward? Um, and the second part is just, your view and outlook on the retail space, you know, shopping malls like Simon Property versus others like, um, you know, strip shopping centers kind of going forward. Great. Thank you for the question. So, uh, so there's a question about wireless tower companies. There are three uh, publicly traded companies, American Tower, SBA Communication, Crown Castle, and then a follow-up question on retail. I'll try to be brief in my answer. Um, uh, wireless tower companies are phenomenal businesses. Um, they tend to have long-term visibility into their cash flow, their 10-year leases, annual rent escalators every year. Anytime a new tenant is added to a tower, 
almost all the cash flow goes to the bottom line, about 90% incremental margins. And of course, it's benefiting from the secular demand driver of the world's going wireless. And so long term, our firm has uh, invested in the wireless tower companies. Having said that, our team late last year um, did some excellent work, and I'll give a shout out to George Tarras and, and David Kirschenbaum on this. Uh, and we spent a lot of time speaking to the various management teams and concluded late last year that the wireless tower companies were going to face significant growth headwinds in the year ahead for a whole host of reasons. Some of it are refinancing headwinds, some of it were decommissioning trends, some of it were international trends, some of it had to do with the wireless carriers uh, spending less on CapEx. And the tower stocks have been, we largely exited the tower companies um, late last year. In fact, we've had zero exposure, or call it about 100 basis points for, or just 1% of the portfolio it was double digit late last year. Um, it'd be a surprise perhaps to many in the room that the tower stocks have been the worst performing category mm -hmm. of commercial real estate this year, even worse than office REITs. Um, fast forward to today, and the stocks have corrected, the valuations are more reasonable. Suffice it to say, I can't tell you what we're doing intra-quarter, um, but we're taking a fresh look again. Um, some of these headwinds that were weighing on the companies this year, we think will be less of an issue on a go-forward basis. One company in particular we think is going to inflect positively from a growth perspective. And so long-term terrific, short-term in 23, not good. We're doing some work on the category, but long-term towers is a great place to be in, again, because of that secular demand driver on wireless. Retail, I'll be briefer. Um, this isn't an area that we typically spend much time focusing on. Um, we're, we're focused on companies that have sustainable long-term growth opportunities. Retail has a trifecta of headwinds of we're over-retailed in our country. You have e-commerce as a headwind to retail, and many of these retail malls or shopping centers are going to require billions and billions of dollars of capital to repurpose into alternative uses. And so this isn't an area that is high up on our priority list for real estate. That doesn't mean that there aren't some one-off companies that are interesting, but that's not something that we're spending much time on. Thank you, Jeff. Question over by Wayne, please. Uh, good, good morning, Charlie Gross. Uh, Neil, this is for you in the healthcare space. Uh, I note that United is, I think, the biggest holding in the fund. Um, given that, are you looking at other opportunities in the health insurance slash healthcare provider space, or do you just say, we've done it with United, that covers the waterfront, and move on? No, we, we definitely are looking at other opportunities um, in the managed healthcare space, as well as the healthcare provider space. There's, there are plenty of interesting companies outside of United Healthcare. Um, that's a great company. Um, in the managed healthcare space, scale does give significant competitive advantages. So the fact that United is, is um, so large in, with their footprint, their, their membership base, and they also have a you know, significant business with Optum. Um, so it, it, it's a great company, but that's not to say that there aren't other opportunities out there. So, you know, we spend a lot of time, um, th there, there was a whole host of sort of new types of managed healthcare companies that came to the public markets over the past few years. We looked at all of them. Um, and in the provider space, there's also, you know, interesting companies out there that are in the smaller um, cap range that we evaluate and analyze. Okay, thanks, Neil. Scott has a question over there. Yeah, hi, my name is Frank DeVico. A question for Jeff on, on real estate. Um, more specifically, I, I was hoping to get a little bit more color on the, the office space and um, just a little bit more detail around the evolution that you see there, taking into account working from home, uh, the fact that uh, legacy buildings are not attractive and how are those ever gonna get occupied or utilized versus modern buildings. Um, in terms of regional uh, location, which locations might be uh, preferable to others, you know, state to state, things like that. You know, you spoke earlier about a 95% number. I know you were talking about commercial real estate across the board, but I don't think the number's that high Not for office. office. Um, but just want to get a little bit more of your prognosis there and where you see opportunity or where you see fallout. We could spend a lot of, thank you. Uh, we could spend a lot of time on this. 
um, but I'll, I'll bottom line it. Uh, we're bearish on office real estate. Um, that doesn't mean every office asset in every market. There are some office assets that are cash flowing very well that have terrific tenants and will perform well if they're well located and they have the right amenities um, uh, and the right tenants and they'll perform well. But as a general statement, our view of Barron Capital is that much of office real estate is in both secular decline and, and perhaps cyclical decline to the extent that we head into an economic slowdown. What I mean by secular decline is, if you think about it, everything, the analysis for real estate is, is frankly, reasonably straightforward. It's just demand relative to supply. Well, on the demand side, the demand pool, meaning the tenants, are shrinking. They're going to be shrinking over the next 10 to 15, 20 years. Why? One big element is work from home. Many companies are embracing a hybrid work model where you can work from home two days a week, three days a week, or permanently. Well, what's that going to do? It's going to mean that the required floor space is going to be decreasing over a period of time. That's part of the secular headwind. Then when you overlay in many markets that there's excess supply of real estate, too many office buildings, that's a bad cocktail mix for where rents and cash flow are ultimately going. Um, Notwithstanding the fact that, let's say, right here in our backyard in New York City, the inventory of office assets are old. Most of the buildings are 40, 50, 60 years old and are in need of a major upgrade to entice new tenants to stay in their buildings. That requires billions and billions of dollars of capital, or in some cases, a need to tear down the buildings and redevelop them. But again, earning the type of return that's required to do that, given elevated construction costs, labor costs, material costs, et cetera, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So office real estate, we have zero exposure, you know, Okay, so what do you really mean? Just look at our portfolio. We have zero exposure. Um, this isn't an area that we think is compelling when we look out over a multi-year basis. But again, I just want to underscore, that doesn't mean every office asset, but when we have opportunities to look through the various food groups of real estate, this is an area similar to retail, not to the same degree, um, or excuse me, office, frankly, we're more concerned about than many segments of retail. But that's, uh, that's our general view there. Thanks, Jeff. Question by Jennifer. Thank you. Could you please tell us about how you decide position sizing in the funds? I see plenty, three or four percent positions, and then eight or nine percent. But how do you think about it going into a new position and then managing it as the price changes? You guys just want to go down the line, start with them? Want to go first? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so position size is really a function of, of conviction. Uh, combined with expected returns. So our highest conviction names are the ones that we feel best about. They may not have the highest expected returns, but it's a function of the confidence level in those returns. So as, as a broad statement, uh, that is what informs position sizing. I maintain a, a relatively concentrated fund between 40 and 50 stocks. So that's you know around two to three percent position sizes on average, and the ones at the higher end of the, of the spectrum or above the average are the ones that we know very well and have high confidence in, in future returns. And then the smaller position sizes may be um, starter positions where we don't know the company as well, um, or they may be on their way out of the portfolio. So in the healthcare fund, um, position size is also a function of conviction. It's also a function of our assessment of the risk. Um, what is the potential downside in the stock? So the larger positions in the healthcare fund tend to be what we would consider to be safer investments. So the, you know, the upside might not be as great, um, but the downside is also, um, in our view, um, you know, protected. Um, and then in terms of managing position sizes, I mean, the theme of the conference is own it. So we typically don't try to, you know, adjust the position size that often based on, you know, the stock moves in the short term. Um, we do that to some degree when there's been, um, you know, an obvious change in the stock price that we think, um, where we think, you know, it makes sense to add. Um, we tend not to reduce, even, even when a stock has performed well, um, 
assuming that the investment thesis is still valid and we see long-term upside in the stock. Yeah, I'm not going to add much more. Um, I concur with everything they said. Uh, we run two relatively concentrated real estate strategies. Uh, the Barron Real Estate Strategy right now has 36 or 37 companies. Our income strategy has about 26 or 27. Large positions typically are 5% or so and do creep up into the high single digits. You will not see in our strategy in either one that we manage position sizes that are 15, 20% of the strategy. Um, a high conviction um, company that we have a long history with, that we have confidence in over a long period of time, might be in the five, six, seven percent neighborhood. Um, but as it approaches 10 percent, just from a risk management perspective, we're going to start to think about perhaps um, trimming it just from a, 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 a risk management perspective. Let me stop there so we can get through more questions. Thank you, guys. Questions in the audience? Raise your hand. Someone will come around. I think Wayne has one right here. <clears throat> Thank you. Question for Jeff on invitation homes. Any general comments? Plus, there's a recent article in the journal that they thought the assets were, or the price was about 20% discount to NAV. Uh, thoughts on that? And also, kudos. Uh, about a year and a half ago, you were real positive on Vernado. You did a 180 degree change, and I just think that's great. And you were right. But I just think that's great when uh, you make a change like that rather than going down with the ship. Thank you. I didn't even ask him to say that. That was so kind. Thank you. Um, I didn't even remember that. We're so busy. We have a lot going on, so thank you. Um, uh, invitation homes. Um, I actually had a... Con so our team, um, we spend the bulk of our time meeting with management teams and speaking to them um, throughout the day. In fact, yesterday, coincidentally, our team was on the phone with Invitation Homes. I couldn't join for, uh, for that call. Um, actually, earlier this week, we were on with our competitor yesterday, American Homes. Um, for those that don't know, Invitation Homes is a single-family home rental REIT. So they have acquired 80,000 homes across the country, and they rent them. So if you're looking for shelter, you can buy a home, you can rent an apartment in a vertical structure, or you can rent a home. There are two publicly traded single-family REITs. We own both of them, Invitation Homes and American Homes. Bottom line, we're very bullish on both Invitation Homes and American Homes. Um, there is a shortage of homes for rent. Many households are desiring of not living in a vertical structure apartment and also have some concerns because of the affordability challenges of purchasing a home and want a home. So they rent a home, they want the flexibility of a home. Uh, renting a home is much more affordable than purchasing a home right now. Invitation Homes has 80,000 homes in many of the best geographic markets in the country. We see a pathway for this company to double its portfolio over time. We're very optimistic about Invitation Homes. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions out there? One over here. Yep. Perfect. Uh, first, uh, thank you all. Um, and my introduction to uh, Barron was the real estate fund, so special thanks to Jeff. <laughs> um, and, but this question is actually for Josh. Um, in the micro finance space, can you talk a little bit more about that and the future and any one-offs that you may be particularly bullish on? What exactly do you mean by microfinance? I say smaller cap um, fintech companies. Oh, okay, got you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of our smaller cap names that we that we feel pretty excited about. I mean, one would be Indava, uh, which is an IT services company that um, builds custom software largely for financial services companies and payment companies. Uh, it was a high flyer uh, for, for many years. Uh, the business continued to execute well, uh, but over the last year and a half, it's underperformed. Uh, the share price has underperformed. The business itself has done quite well, but uh, along with other high growth stocks that experienced tremendous multiple expansion um, prior to 2021, 
it pulled back uh, a fair bit. The share price pulled back. But we're quite excited uh, about the future growth of this business. Um, the market cap is around 2 to $3 billion. Uh, they have been around for over 20 years now. It's a founder-led company. Uh, the CEO, John Cotterell, um, has assembled a team of uh, 6,000 workers uh, all over the world who uh, build custom software and uh, do very advanced uh, software development for companies like MasterCard, who is their largest customer. Uh, MasterCard is a global operation. Uh, even with all of their capabilities, they still rely on companies like Indava to um, improve their network, add new features and functionality. Indava had been growing organically uh, over 20% per year for many, many years. And then when rates, uh, interest rates went up uh, and greater macro uncertainty um, took place, a lot of that business confidence was sapped. And so some of the projects that their customers had planned on doing, they said, well, we're going we're gonna to wait. We're going to delay these plans. Those plans don't go away. The demand is still there, but it's deferred. And so uh, growth has slowed uh, because of that macroeconomic uh, uncertainty. But we think that that demand will come back, and they'll return to their 20% plus organic growth rates, continue to do acquisitions. Uh, this is a very well-financed uh, business, has no debt, plenty of cash. So it can survive this downturn uh, in demand, or this pause in demand, very nicely, and we think is uh, a coiled spring as the business itself accelerates back to what we think are the long-term growth rates. And the multiple has compressed dramatically. And so we think there is tremendous opportunity for growth to accelerate and for the multiple to expand which is in contrast, I think, to how many of our investments, how we underwrote many of our investments over the last 12 years uh, since I've joined Barron, where we saw a very rapid growth in a lot of businesses, but a lot of that growth was already reflected in the multiple. And so even though we thought that a business could double its share price in the next five years, we incorporated a meaningful amount of multiple compression over that period. Stocks that may trade at a high multiple on near-term earnings and then a more normalized multiple five years out. Now, the environment we're in is that some of the growth rates are depressed. We think that growth can accelerate and multiples can expand back to what we think are more normal levels. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. And that's how you get 800 bips over the benchmark uh, <laughs> since inception. So I uh, look forward to the five-year anniversary. And that's going to conclude our panel. I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank you all for your questions and wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you.